Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to ESG Talks, a KBRA podcast series focusing on environmental, social, and governance, ESG. This podcast series highlights various ESG hot topics and includes commentary from prominent voices within the ESG community. In this episode of ESG Talks, I talk with Gordon Kerr, KBRA's Head of European Research, discussing our recent research piece, An Overview of the European Green Deal, which is the first piece in our series focusing on ESG-related regulation in Europe. Gordon and I discuss details of various policies included under the European Green Deal, including the EU climate law, Fit for 55, the Just Transition Fund, and the Sustainable Finance Strategy, which includes the EU taxonomy, the Corporate Sustainable Reporting Directive, and the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Hello to all of our listeners. This is Emily Nadler, a director on KBRA's ESG team. Thank you, Gordon, for joining me today to provide our listeners with an overview of the European Green Deal. So, Gordon, I want to start at a broad level and discuss the goals of the European Green Deal. What was the impetus behind passing the deal and, and what are the goals of the policies included? Thanks, Emily. Yeah, the European Green Deal was launched in December 2019 as the incoming European Parliament took action towards green efforts, mainly prompted by the increasingly severe effects of climate change and the recognition by policymakers that the region needs to move towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions. But also, the EU wanted to position itself as a global climate leader and lead in the development of green and and clean technology. And many policies under the Green Deal promote research, development, and innovation in this area. The plan's ambitious goals are not only to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but to promote job growth, address energy poverty and economic inequality, increase regional energy security, and improve public health. The deal includes numerous proposals on a range of topics, including sustainable food and agriculture, biodiversity, the circular economy, battery waste, sustainable chemicals, clean energy, sustainable transportation, and even deforestation. Overall, a wholesome look at the uh, entire market to try and improve the green prospects for Europe. Thanks for that, Gordon. Clearly, there's a lot covered under the deal. So lots of corporations and countries have net zero greenhouse gas emissions targets. However, these plans are increasingly being scrutinized with accusations of greenwashing. Critics say that many of these are just a set of murky goals that lack any real commitment to emissions reductions. Is the EU's goal of climate neutrality by 2050 legally binding? Yes. Under the uh, European climate law negotiated under the Green Deal, the EU is now legally committed to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. It also legislates a target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 relative to 1990 levels. Importantly, this means that the EU's 27 member states will need to take action to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to meet its regional goals. However, the EU also recognizes that different member states have varying abilities to make the transition. For example, some member states such as Poland and Bulgaria have more carbon intensive economies and rely more heavily on fossil fuels than other member states. So in light of this, the EU implemented the Just Transition Fund, which gives access to additional funding for member countries that will be most negatively impacted by the climate transition. The, they have various criteria for investment, which are based on member state emissions, employment numbers, and particularly in highly polluting industries, such as coal mining, the level of production of oil shale and peat, and regional economic development. Any member country that meets these criteria but doesn't have a net zero emissions target by 2050 will only receive 50% of the allocated funding. The fund is moderate, but not inconsiderate, with a budget of 17.5 billion euros to invest in these regions over the period of 2021 to 2027. So the EU has set the legally binding goal, but now let's take a look at how they'll actually achieve it. An important part of the policy package was the Fit for 55 legislation, 
which includes specific proposals and regulation on how the EU will meet the target of a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030. Can you talk about some of the policies initiatives included in Fit for 55? Yeah, so Fit for 55 revises many existing EU laws to ensure the region will make its 2030 target, as you've said. It also contains many policy proposals. So just to highlight a few important pieces of the legislation, under Fit for 55, the European Commission strengthened the regulatory requirements and expanded the scope of the region's emissions trading scheme with plans of uh, 62% emissions reduction in covered sectors by 2030 relative to 2005 levels. Another important part of the package is the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which was provisionally agreed upon in December 22, and will apply fees on imported products in carbon intensive sectors. The Fit for 55 also includes increased carbon emission standards for vehicles, and EU lawmakers recently approved additional regulatory requirements to make car manufacturers achieve a 100% cut in carbon emissions from new car sales, which effectively bans the sale of new fossil fuel vehicles by 2035. This is a very important step as transportation represents nearly a quarter of the EU's total emissions. And we've started to see that coming to the fore as more and more manufacturers are bringing forward battery and hybrid electric vehicles. So, Emily, I've now provided most of the framework of how the EU Green Deal addresses the public sector shift to a low carbon economy. But a very important part of the Green Deal is the sustainable finance picture, which addresses the private sector. Turning it to you, Emily, what is the goal of the EU's sustainable finance strategy? Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, so the EU climate strategy emphasizes the need for the financial sector to integrate ESG metrics into investment decisions to promote long-term sustainable economic activity. The EC has said the financial sector will play a pivotal role in reaching the EU's climate goals by shifting capital towards sustainable technologies, projects, and businesses, ensuring financial growth is sustainable over the longer term, and supporting the transition to a low-carbon, climate-resilient, and circular economy. So a core part of the European Commission's sustainable finance initiative is increasing transparency and reporting standards for financial activity in the region. How is the EU working to achieve this? The overarching legislation is framework is the EU taxonomy. Can you take us through that first? So as you've mentioned, the Sustainable Finance Initiative is a really key part of the legislation and and probably the most important for our listeners as it applies to many firms in the financial industry. There are a few parts to it that I'll discuss, but as you said, the first is the EU taxonomy that really provides the framework for the disclosure rules that that we'll discuss after. So a global challenge in the the adoption of ESG integration in financial markets has been the differing approaches to what classifies as a positive environmental and social impact. The taxonomy outlines what the EU considers to be a sustainable economic activity and attempts to create common, clear language around what qualifies as a sustainable investment in the EU. The taxonomy outlines six environmental objectives for sustainable economic activity. These are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, the sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, the transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and the protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. So these are obviously pretty broad goals, but the taxonomy sets out specific environmental performance requirements so that financial market participants can ensure that these requirements are being met under under each of the six environmental objectives. The regulation also specifically states that for an economic activity to be considered taxonomy aligned, progress towards one objective is not made at the expense of the other. So the next pieces of the sustainable finance initiative I want to highlight are are the non-financial reporting directive or NR NFRD, the corporate sustainability reporting directive, the CSRD, and the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, SFDR. I'm sure you've heard many of those acronyms before as a listener, but anyway, those have been outlined now. How are financial market participants expected to disclose under these rules? Yes, thank you. So we're really entering into the acronym world um, where there's a lot of it under, under ESG. 
But so importantly, with NFRD, EU regulators introduced the concept of double materiality, which requires companies to report not only on sustainability factors that are financially material, but also on how the company's own activities impact the environment and society. So the NFRD covers firms with more than 500 employees and requires disclosure in four categories, environmental factors, social factors and employees, respect for human rights, and anti-corruption and bribery. Companies disclose on an explain or comply basis, meaning that they either comply with the mandated disclosure indicators or explain why the information was not provided. So this is kind of the current disclosure that is in place right now. And then the CSRD came into force in January 2023 and will replace the NFRD, expanding the disclosure required and the scope of companies covered. Under the CSRD, EU companies that meet two of the three of the following qualifications must disclose relevant sustainability information. So more than 250 employees, revenues of more than 40 million euros, and or total assets of more than 20 million euros. Approximately 12,000 companies are covered under the NFRD currently, and this number will increase to 50,000 firms under the CSRD. Under CSRD, companies will disclose for the financial year 2024, and reports will be published in 2025. The disclosure requirements are still in the process of being drafted and finalized, but the most recent draft included ESG disclosure on, on various topics, including environmental metrics relating to climate change, pollution, water and marine resources, biodiversity and ecosystems, resource use, and the circular economy, social metrics related to workforce, the value chain of workers, affected communities, consumers, and end users, and then governance metrics on business conduct. The last disclosure requirement that I want to highlight is the SFDR. And this was designed to increase disclosure and transparency in financial markets and help distinguish various investment activities that integrate ESG objectives. The regulation took effect in March 2021 and outlines disclosure rules at both the firm and product level including specific categorization types for sustainable financial products. Under the SFDR, financial market participants, including asset managers, institutional investors, insurance companies, and pension funds, among others, must disclose how they consider environmental and social factors when making investment decisions, and if they do, how this is reflected at the product level. At the product level, SFDR regulation resulted in two main sustainable product categories, Article 8 and Article 9 compliant financial products, which I'm sure many people have heard about. These have been in the news a lot recently. Article 8 requires any financial products that actively promote ESG characteristics to disclose how these characteristics are met. These types of products have been informally named light green funds. And then under Article 9, products that have a specific sustainability goal as their objective dark green funds, must detail how the product is aligned with that goal. I think it's very important to say that the EU is constantly working on new policy initiatives and proposals under the European Green Deal. So the pieces discussed today are really just the initial wave of legislation and many parts, especially the sustainable finance initiative, are likely to be expanded and refined. So I think this provides a good understanding of the basics of the deal, and our listeners and readers can look forward to more updates from us on any ESG-related regulatory updates. I also wanted to say that Gordon hosts a podcast, Conversations in European Credit, that I would encourage everyone to listen to. Conversations in European Credit brings together KBRA analysts from across the company to discuss topical issues in European capital markets. So thank you again, Gordon, for for joining me today to cover the very ambitious and, and very important European Green Deal. Thank you very much, Emily. This concludes our episode. Please email esg at kbra.com with any questions or comments. We also encourage you to visit KBRA's ESG website at esg.kbra.com, where you can find ESG research related to the topics discussed in this episode, further details on KBRA's ESG approach, and other ESG-related media items. You can also join our mailing list to access our ESG weekly roundup newsletter. Music